on a day than we have. Lots of great uh, content to cover on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if you uh, haven't gotten a handout, there are some back in the back. Uh, and it's a little bit smaller than it has been by the grace of God. It's, it's really nice. So um, we're going to pick up on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. From Dr. Sproul. I can't remember which book this is from, but I think it's a great start because it's really encouraging for us. It says there is no greater gift that Lord God can give any of us than to forgive us for every sin that we've committed. The more we understand that, the greater the love we have for him because he who is forgiven much loves much. Our love for God increases to the extent that we know how undeserving we are of the pardon and the generous forgiveness that he bestows. We study scripture to better know both of those facts. So isn't it amazing that, you know, when you've, when you've lived in grace for so many years, you forget the depth of your forgiveness? And I don't know if you remember that illustration, but the quick illustration, you know, if we sin 10 times a day or only five or maybe even just three times a day, if we only sin three times a day, we'd be a walking angel, wouldn't we? Well, three sins a day is a thousand sins in a year. And over my 71-year lifetime, that would be 71,000 sins that I've been forgiven. And that's if we only sin three times a day. It's probably more like 3,000 or 3 million. Who knows how many sins there are a day, but just the depth of that forgiveness. And it kind of puts that parable in light, doesn't it? That, you know, he who has been forgiven much loves much. Well, you know what? We should continually go back and be reviewing that. So, Tom, you feeling well enough to pray for us and open us up this morning? Yes. You look like you're here today. Good. No would have been an okay answer to. So please pray, would you? Holy Father, we are so grateful for this time of your teaching and for Mike's work through the week to prepare for us. We sit under the teaching of Lord and the Southern Union Grace. This is the way that God the Holy Spirit will work through us to sanctify us and to help us work out our own salvation. So uh, let us I just pray that God the Holy Spirit would be at work even now in Mike's heart. Amen. There's a, a book that I would want to recommend to you. Um, this is an old book. Again, it's uh, 24 years old. It was 1999, published by Dr. MacArthur. And if you look at the picture on the back, he's even still doing a comb over, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, but it's called The Charismatic Chaos. And uh, it addresses things like signs and wonders, speaking in tongues, health and wealth gospel, charismatic televangelism, and does God still speak today or... or the continuation of, of uh, Revelation. So it's a great book. If you've never read it, it's a good book to use as a tool. Uh, it, and it's basically a question and answer, and it goes through, you know, just tons and tons of great topics. So I'd recommend it to you, especially if you find over the next few weeks um, that there's things there that, that you may disagree with us even, and that's fine. What we'd encourage you to do is to ask us and to let us know and then to study. So this week we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be finishing up the role of the paraclete from last week. And then we're going to uh, move ahead into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then next week will be the gift of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit. Week after that will be fruit of the Spirit. And week after that will be miracles, are they for today? Uh, and so... There ought to be some lively discussion on that, especially when Brent's leading us, you know, and gives us a chance to talk, unlike somebody else who teaches. So um, I also got another uh, really great recommendation. And I think when we went through the review part last week, you know, we were kind of smoking through there and people said, well, where are we in this handout? Well, guess what? I included the review in there this week because I also think that it's a, a really good summary of where we are in pneumatology, and I think it's kind of a good checkpoint right in the middle of that study. So picking up where it says review in your handout, the pneumatology, the study of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, Brent covered great the Holy Spirit in the Old and New Testament. Basically, it was a scriptural basis for the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, for pneumatology, for the person and work of the Spirit. Uh, then a uh, week after that, we talked about the confessional teaching 
on the Holy Spirit. We've looked at the Westminster Confession, Westminster Shorter Catechism, and the Heidelberg Catechism. And then last week, we started talking about the Holy Spirit as paraclete or comforter. But in summary, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. He is God, and we need to continually remind us that. And he is probably the most active manifestation of the presence of God in our lives today because he is continually speaking to us and continually urging us to do the things that we are so uh, properly to do in obedience to God. He's equal in power and glory to the Father and the Son. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is a person. He is not just a power. He has a will. He has knowledge. He has affections. He has everything that makes the Father a person, everything that makes the uh, Son a person. Also, He is a person. He has true personhood. So in both the Old and New Testament, we see the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit empowers. He gives life, as it says. He purifies. Especially in the New Testament, we see Him being the agent of regeneration. He is what moves regeneration in us. He is what makes us willing and able to seek the word of God, that that would be applied to our hearts and that we could repent and believe. He reveals the word to us. I mean, that is amazing. This passage, 2 Peter 1.21, if you've never read that passage, you need to do so. And I would even encourage you to put that one to memory because it says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is just manifest in our life. Every time we look, we're seeing the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I love the book of Acts. And in one sermon series that a former pastor did, he suggested that the book of Acts should not be called the Acts of the Apostles. It should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the Apostles or through the Apostles. It's the Holy Spirit working. And... Uh, he unifies us. You know, there's, uh, there's one bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit. And he fulfills our need for another comforter. Remember, our first comforter was Jesus himself. He is our advocate. He is our advocate before the Father today. Hebrews tells us that he is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Have you thought about that in a while? Uh, if you want something to meditate on and kind of feel heavy in your life, think about Jesus in a resurrected body right now at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. I once heard it said by another pastor that the Holy Spirit provide, takes our prayers and provides them as arrows to Jesus who then shoots them into the heart of the Father as he's intervening for us. It's just a, a wonderful thing to think about our two comforters, Jesus as our intercessor and the Holy Spirit who is with us here today. The Holy Spirit comforts us here and now. We said that he consoles us, and that's typically what you think about when you think of comfort, isn't it? But he also strengthens us, and we'll be digging into that a little bit more today. So this morning, over the next half hour, we're going to continue with the Holy Spirit as paraclete. We're going to talk about the charismatic movement and what effect it's had on modern doctrine and modern beliefs. And we'll, we'll brush over that. Uh, we'll talk about the history and doctrine of this whole concept of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me just put your heart at ease. You have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've done it. It's there. God did it in you. Okay, you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You are filled constantly with the Holy Spirit. And that's what we are to pray for. Uh, that's what Tom prayed for, that, you know, me and Eric, as we're standing up in front of you, would be filled with the Holy Spirit. We pray that each one of you, as you're hearing the sermon, as you're hearing this lesson, would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you could understand it. And then the book of Acts is, is really our basis for understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So quickly, it's, still, it's, in, your, um, it's in your handout, so uh, we, I included that from last week's handout as well. Uh, we're trying to make it easier and easier so, um, to keep up with the lessons. So we're going to talk about the role of the paraclete. Remember that paraclete... is someone who is alongside us in strength in the midst of trials 
and he comforts us with that strength, knowing that he's always there. Uh, John 16, 12, 15. Will somebody read that one, please? So the Holy Spirit will come beside us. He'll give us strength. He'll encourage us. He'll tell us all the things that he knows. And the interesting thing I want to point out from this passage is, where does the Holy Spirit point? Does the Holy Spirit point to himself and says, I'm God, look what I'm doing? Does he? No. Where does he point, Ken? He points to Jesus, okay? He brings us to Jesus. He convicts us of why we need Christ. He brings us to him, and he keeps us there. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, would somebody read the Luke 12 passage, please? I mean, what's the best example we see of that in Scripture? Was well, in Acts 3 when Peter has been, uh, has been apprehended and he's brought before the Sanhedrin and he's going to be punished. And what does he do? He doesn't make excuses. He witnesses. The Holy Spirit fills him that he speaks with those words. And so I think it is so encouraging for us as believers to know that that's what God does for us through his Holy Spirit. Um, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you were, you know, sharing your faith with someone and they ask a really tough question that you didn't think you were going to be able to answer? And then all of a sudden that answer came. That's the Holy Spirit at work in you. Okay, and even if you can't answer that question right away, best thing to do is make an appointment to get back again. Okay, there is nothing better that could happen out of an interaction with somebody about your faith than to schedule another time to get together because you know what that will lead to another time that you can get together and on and on so it's great to see it but the holy spirit is working in our lives we are more than conquerors the holy spirit develops consoles and strengthens us through the application of truth because that's what we need jesus says my word is truth and that's what this we need for soul. Listen to what Dr. Sproul says. He said, they had been strengthened, encouraged by his presence, but he was going away. And that's talking about Jesus. Yet they were not left to fend for themselves. This Holy Spirit would be with them to speak truth, to encourage them, and to cause them to be faithful in the midst of trouble. Christ kept his promise on the day of Pentecost when he sent the Holy Spirit to his people, the church. Therefore, when the persecution came, the church of Christ blossomed. His people were consciously aware of the strength that Christ had given them to stand against a hostile world. Um, what an amazing thing to know that, that that's what God has done for us, that he sent us another comforter. And he didn't take the other comforter away. Okay, that other comforter is before the Father advocating on our behalf. And what a joy to know that God has provided for us. He's not only given us salvation through his grace, but he has provided for us in an ongoing way. And I think it's pretty amazing to, to meditate on that. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to meditate on scripture. And, and really what that means is, is as you read scripture, don't just read it to get the page count done. You know, there, there are many of us that like to read through the scripture in a year, and sometimes you find yourself reading your five chapters a day so that you can get it done. But we need to do better than that. We need to think about scripture. We need to study scripture as we're going through it. And we need to really consider, think about what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. You know, meditate on it. So let's, let's turn our hearts now over to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful thing. You have it. Okay, it is a doctrine of the church. 
but the interesting thing is, like many doctrines, the um, baptism of the Holy Spirit has kind of been turned a little bit on its ear. But we're going to find the truth in that this morning, I hope, by, by looking at the Scripture. Uh, but the first thing we're going to look at is one of the reasons that, that we live the way we do today, that we hear so many things about the Holy Spirit that we hear today, is the effect of this charismatic movement. Um, and we're going to talk about it. And let me tell you, I'm not saying it is all bad, okay? I'm not, I'm not putting it down at all. What I want you to do is to understand what the charismatic movement is about and its effect. Dr. Sproul said, more books have been written on the person and work of the Holy Spirit in the last 50 years than in all of the previous Christian history combined. And the charismatic movement is a driving force behind that. Um, Dr. Sproul said that since the 60s, it can be said that we live in the age of the Holy Spirit because there has been so much written and so much uh, activity around the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about that charismatic movement. It had an incredible impact on the church, uh, and it's formed a lot of our uh, beliefs. And in fact, you don't see many Reformed televangelists, do you? And that's not because we as Reformed people don't believe in evangelism. It's because we believe that evangelism comes from the truth. And you know what? People really aren't excited very much by the preaching of the gospel, you know, by televangelists. They want to see fantastic things. And so the uh, impact of this movement began in the 19th century. But in the mid-20th century, it has crossed over into practically every denomination. Guys, if, if you don't know it, there are charismatic PCA churches, okay? There are charismatic Catholic churches. My, uh, I, I think I shared with you guys that I was raised in a Catholic family, and of seven children, I'm the only non-Catholic in the group, and uh, one of my older brothers went to a Catholic retreat, and throughout that retreat, he said this, this guy who was kind of his mentor was constantly, pray for tongues, pray for tongues, pray for tongues, and uh, he said, he eventually looked at him and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to rip yours out if you ask me one more time to pray for tongues. And uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's a little bit of everywhere. And that roots of, move, of that movement goes back to Pentecostalism. And we're going to talk just a little bit about Pentecostalism this morning. And I don't want to generalize too much, okay? I'm going to talk about historic Pentecostalism. But when you go to Church of God, Church of God in Christ, Assemblies of God, a lot of these uh, Pentecostal background churches, you're going to see widely varying beliefs. So if you start uh, interacting with a, someone with a Pentecostal penchant, with somebody who is um, a member of one of these churches that wants to know, and, and the key to know is they're going to ask you if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the answer is yes, you have. Okay, if you know Christ, Okay, who has this Christ has the Spirit? Um, and you can answer yes, and if, then they're going to ask you some more questions. But let me just point out to you, um, don't generalize. These are just some general background, some basis for questions that you can ask them, because that's the best way to learn, isn't it, is to ask them and to engage them in dialogue. So the main doctrines, though, of Pentecostalism, it's a four-square gospel. How many of you have heard that term, four-square gospel? Have you ever known what it meant? I haven't. I do now, okay, after doing a little research. Uh, it's also called the full gospel, and these four tenets that are shown in your handout are the four tenets of that four-square gospel, and you know what? We don't take exception with many of them. Uh, first one, Jesus saves according to John 3, 16. Amen. Uh, by the grace of God, Jesus saves according to John 3, 16. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit according to Acts 2, 4, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, the first part of that we believe. We believe that we've been uh, baptized by the Holy Spirit and that we're continually filled with the Holy Spirit as we pray. We just don't believe that uh, we speak in other tongues, you know, as the Spirit gave them utterance. It happened in Acts 2, okay? Let me just be very clear. It indeed happened in Acts 2 that they spoke in other languages. It's pretty clear from the original languages that they spoke in other languages because people were hearing them in their own language. 
I mean, I've often wondered if the miracle wasn't the speaking, but the miracle was in the hearing. But it says that they spoke in other languages. Jesus heals bodily, according to James 5.15. And I believe that there are still healings that are done according to James 5.15. But that is because it is in God's decree, not because someone has demanded that they be healed, but because it was always in God's decree that that person should be healed. And I praise God for that. Okay, and, and you know what? God uses the means of prayer to heal people. In other words, in his decree, the end was that somebody may be healed, but the means that God ordained was prayer of his people or whatever other, and the work of the doctors and all those things that are all within God's decree. Because James 5.15 says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Well, the Lord will raise him up if it is God's will. If it is in his decree, he will do so. And so what we need to do is continually look to know that God is sovereign in his world and that his decree is full of those uh, events. And those events are what he plans that will happen. And then Jesus is coming again to receive those who are saved according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. So that's their, their basic tenets. A um, lot of great discussions you can have with your uh, Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Uh, and as Eric and I have been interchanging a little email this weekend or this week on this topic, some of them indeed are your brothers and sisters in Christ. I'd say a lot of them are. But some of them are so led away by experience and the seeking of experience that they no longer concentrate on the truth of God's word. They concentrate on experience. And I believe that those uh, brothers, those men and women may be led astray and may not be brothers and sisters in Christ. But the point is, is to dig, ask the questions and to dig in to what it is that they're uh, having to say. They're generally Arminian in their beliefs and, and a lot of our Baptist brothers and sisters are also Armenian. A lot of good Reformed Baptists these days as well. Uh, but what that really means is that they are counting on their own desires to want to come to Christ. They don't believe that it is by, um, by Christ working in them by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. They believe that there's that little inkling of goodness left in them so that they can make that decision of whether or not they come to Christ. Um, the assurance of, of, of salvation is pretty weak in a Pentecostal believer. They believe that they can easily backslide. That's why you see so much revivalism within Pentecostalism, is because they feel that they're continually needed to be called back to the altar to, to, to make that decision once again. And their assurance is conditioned on obedience. If they obey all those four things, um, that we talked about in the four square gospel if they believe all those four things if they never fail then they can be assured of salvation but if they fail then they can't be assured of salvation and you'll hear them uh saying that they are being saved yet again eric was there something you wanted to say i'm sorry oh okay i thought you, when you were leaning forward i thought okay here it comes so anyway um and it focuses on experience like we've already talked about. For example, speaking in tongues, bodily healing, those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we love in Presbyterian worship is order. We love a good, solid order of worship where God speaks to us and we respond back to him. And if you notice in our order of worship, that cycle is repeated time and time again. And our elders go to great uh, effort to make sure that we follow a well-formed order of worship when we come together for public worship. Uh, but a lot of times, if you have ever been to a Pentecostal service, it, uh, it's just the opposite. It's, it can be very disorderly because there is so much going on. I'll uh, never forget, back, back in the day when I first became a believer, I love, well, I still love contemporary Christian music, but uh, Carmen, was, was an artist who was really big, and he did this song that my kids just loved. I mean, my boys were little, and, and they just loved it. So there was a concert in, uh, 
in Fort Benning, Georgia, that we drove from Montgomery, Alabama over to see this concert, and the first half of the concert was amazing. But then you know how you go through all the good parts of a, con a Christian concert, and then the singer decides that they need to be a preacher, and they start having their little, uh, their little service, and, and lots of things happen. Well, Carmen went into charismatic mode, and there were people, and he invited people to start speaking in tongues. I don't know why he felt he needed to invite them to do so, but he did. And next thing I know, I got three little boys clumped around my legs. They just, and I was looking for somebody to go stand beside. It was amazing. But it's just, it's very experience focused, and it, I think it leads away from worship. Um, I think a Pentecostal is going to tell you that that is worship that we, the frozen chosen, don't know how to worship, you know, by, by listening and singing and, and uh, reading the Word of God together. But I think that that's what God calls us to. And we'll be talking about worship uh, in the fall as we're talking about ecclesiology. Uh, we'll be talking about the doctrine of worship and the truth. So, okay, any questions, any, any thoughts? If somebody out here, if I'm offending you, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd be more than glad to talk to you afterwards. And, you know, if you have a comment you think everybody should hear, I'd be more than glad to entertain it. Okay. So uh, what Pentecostal basically comes down to is this whole idea of a unique doctrine of salvation. It goes back to uh, Wesleyan perfectionism. And it's, it's also called a second blessing or a second work of grace. The first work of grace is conversion. Pure and simple. They agree on that 100%. But they also believe that there is an equally dramatic second work of the Spirit, and that is the second work of grace. And it allowed one back in history, and some denominations still believe it today, that if you receive that second work of grace, you are at a point of holiness that is perfect. That you have reached a point where God is blessing you for having come to the point that you are so sanctified that he can entrust you with this gift. And this gift they call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was a gift that marked that perfection. And that's where the, this doctrine comes from. That's where it's really been growing. Uh, it's kind of the modern representation of that doctrine because there has always been a baptism of the Holy Spirit taught in Scripture. But it's never been quite the experience-based moment in your life. And it's never been taught as the second blessing throughout Scripture that we'll see in just a few minutes. And the sign that accompanies, they believe the sign that accompanies that moment, that second blessing, was speaking in tongues. And so uh, I think if I started speaking in other languages that you could understand, that somebody could understand, that would be a miracle indeed. But guys, I don't speak very many languages. I don't speak any languages well. Um, but they believe that speaking in tongues, and, and it's an unintelligible language, okay? Some, and they you know, do believe that some can interpret it, but I've never heard an interpretation. I've always heard the, the speaking in language. So, so let's move on. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that doctrine of, of the Holy Spirit. So, the question was, how do you integrate that doctrine with historic Christianity? How do you, how do you meld it in with what with, with the historic church um, has been? Well, some denominations no longer consider that baptism to be a second work of grace for the purpose of sanctification. They teach that it is a second work of grace for the purpose of enabling and for strengthening someone for spirit, for ministry. Uh, that fits real closely with the New Testament uh, concept of the function of the Spirit as far as the Holy Spirit enabling us to do ministry, to do missions. There's no doubt in my mind that people that go to the mission fields have a greater filling of the Holy Spirit than me because there's just so much dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Um, but many today still believe that that indispensable sign that one has received is speaking in tongues. Now, we're going to talk about that next week, okay? So let me just skip over that, if you will, if you allow me to do so. If you really need to, to learn some more about it, you, we can chat uh, during the uh, fellowship time or even uh, 
you know, afterwards. That's great. Book by Dr. Uh, MacArthur, Charismatic Chaos, will address it very, very carefully. So they claim that uh, people who do not speak in tongues have not received the Spirit, and other believes that tongue speaking may or may not accompany the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why when you talk to somebody with a Pentecostal background, be careful, ask questions, learn what they believe. Okay, and understand it and come with some understanding of that. But all neo-Pentecostals, new Pentecostals, modern Pentecostals feel that there is a time gap between conversion and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So consequently, the body of Christ, the church, is a group of haves and have-nots. I mean, I'd hate to be in a church where there were haves and I was the have-not. But we're all haves. We have all we need. And God has blessed us that way. Now, we're working on our sanctification, on our holiness, and that is a synergistic work. That is a work together between the believer and the Holy Spirit. Okay, you've got responsibility in your sanctification, but your justification is done. Okay, that was done once and for all by Christ. So the basis for their view of the doctrine is, is the Acts 2 narrative. It's a wonderful narrative and one that I would highly encourage you to, to go back and read with a little different mindset looking at the operation of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Um, but what's interesting is our basis for understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, exact same thing, Acts 2. Okay, we go back and read it through a really a little bit different lens. So let's look at that uh, Acts 2. The biblical record in Acts, okay, is, is clear. So would somebody read that, that first passage we have, Acts 2, 1 through 4, and then jump over to Acts 12, 2, 12. And we ask that same question today. What does it mean indeed? So if somebody could pick up, here's uh, Luke's answer in Acts. If someone could read that Acts 2, 13 to 18. Okay, there were all kinds of signs and things going on at that time, wasn't there? There was uh, the flames of fire. There was a roaring wind. Uh, I mean, those people had to be a little scared, I mean, as to what was going on around them. And, you know, but when Peter explains those events, what does he do? He goes to Scripture. And, and notice what I've got highlighted. And he invalid, infallibly interprets what is happening? Peter, speaking in the Holy Spirit, gives us an infallible interpretation because is apostolic teaching of what is happening. And he was telling us that the passage from Joel 2, 28 and 29 is being fulfilled. The gifts of the Spirit no longer will be limited to prophets, priests, and kings, as Brent taught us, as they were in the Old Testament and uh, in his previous lessons, they are going to be shared on all believers. And that's the most wonderful gift you can think of, that the Holy Spirit is being poured out on all believers. And that interpretation that Peter gives makes it hard 
to argue that the baptism is only for some, that there are haves and have-nots. Brothers and sisters have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on all believers. Um, the, these Jewish believers at Pentecost all received this new gifting, not just some of them, but all of them. Uh, and there are three other mini Pentecosts in, in Acts, and I, I think it's really great. And we don't have time to dig into them too deeply, but we'll hit them real quickly. So the first ones were the Samaritans, okay? Remember, the Samaritans were hated outcasts. The Jews hated the Samaritans. But the word of God came to the Samaritans, and they came to know Christ. Joe, would you read that Acts 8, 14 to 17? Okay, so those Samaritan believers, those outcasts, okay, received the same Holy Spirit. Okay, Cornelius, who was a God-fearer. Remember, a God-fearer was somebody who had converted to Judaism for everything except circumcision. Uh, they, they truly believed in God. So would somebody read those, the passages from Acts there, please? So these same God-fearers, okay, received the exact same gift that the Jewish believers had received and the believers at Samaria had received. Okay, let's go to some uh, good old Gentile town, okay, Ephesus. Uh, interesting place to visit even today. So would somebody read Acts 19, please? Okay, these Gentiles received the same gift. Okay, as the gospel was preached on these groups, the issue arose to what should be done with those who had believed. They only, they only worried about Jews before, but now they had Samaritans, ew, and they had uh, Gentiles, and they had God-fearers who were receiving the same gifts. Well, two things make that answer clear. All who were present as believers in those episodes received the Holy Spirit. All is the key word. You know, Luke describes four distinct groups of people, the Jews, the Samaritans, the God-fearers, and the Gentiles. And in those events, Luke traced the expansion of the apostolic church. Okay, Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It's amazing how it all fits together, isn't it? That those Pentecostal events, the Pentecost in Acts 2 and the three mini Pentecosts in Acts 3 and beyond reflect that spreading of the church, that growth of the church. And God verified their inclusion with full privileges and membership in the New Testament church. And that gift of the Holy Spirit was the sign. 1 Corinthians 12 says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Luke gives a resounding yes to the question, uh, are these part of the body of Christ? So I just want to address one other thing, and uh, we're going to run over just another minute or so, but that's because I got started late, so... The delay between the conversion and baptism was not normative for the church for all time. In other words, just like miracles, there are period, three periods of miracles in the church, okay? You go back to Moses and uh, at the time of Moses, the time of Elijah and Elisha, the time of Christ and the apostles, okay? Those miracles were there for the forming of the Holy Scripture. Brent's going to be talking about that 
uh, on the Memorial Day weekend. So cancel all your plans. Make sure you're here Memorial Day weekend to hear Brent's lesson on our miracles for today. Um, but miracles were there for the forming of the Word of God. Okay? And the outpouring, the experiential, the aesthetic gifts that were displayed at these four Pentecost-like events were there to show the inclusion of all believers in the church. They're not something that happens every day in the church. They were there for a purpose, and they were there to be recorded in the Word of God. That this time gap, okay, it was there, okay, as a result of the timing between the first Pentecost and the spread of the gospel in the first century. The inclusion of people from every tribe and language and people and nation. So just to bring it right down where it belongs, the baptism of the Holy Spirit coincides with conversion by the grace of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and all Christians are giving these gifts, not just a few. For how else would we come to know that we believe if the Holy Spirit wasn't working in our life? We don't do it on our own. We are saved by grace through faith as God works in our lives. Any comments before we wrap up? Well, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this uh, precious teaching. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. What a wonderful thing, Lord, that not only did you call us to a saving faith, but you also left us another comforter to encourage us in it. God, you're a great God. And uh, we just thank you that uh, you are a God reflected in the word not the God that we would make in our image, Father. And Lord, we just ask special filling of your Holy Spirit even today as we prepare for worship. Let us truly focus on every word that is part of our order of worship today. Let us notice that order of worship where you call to us and we respond to you. And thank you so much, God, for being, being with us. We pray that we hear every word that is preached, every word and every prayer, every word and every song that we sing together. And we thank you, Lord, for this.